You're listening to the Common Descent Podcast. Hi, Will. Hey, David. Hello, listeners. Hello, John. Hello, John. Hello, John. Hello, John. Mr. DNA. Bet no one can guess what this episode's about. And welcome to episode 23 of the Common Descent Podcast. Today, we are talking about Jurassic Park. Oh, boy. This is probably the most eagerly anticipated episode by us. Yes, this (laughs) absolutely. (laughs) This was one of the first episode topics we ever talked about doing. We had a discussion very early on on how long did we need to wait until (laughs) it was not off topic for us to do this. Yes. (laughs) So this episode is going to be devoted to the movie Jurassic Mm -hmm. Park and not just like, you know, what they do right, what they do wrong, but the interesting question of where the film sort of fits into the wide spectrum of that intersection between paleontology and public perception. Absolutely. And it's a really interesting question. So we'll talk about before Jurassic Park, mm-hmm. after Jurassic Park, and what the movie, what makes the movie so notable yes. specifically. This is not a requested episode per se, but it's worth noting that in between the time that we planned this episode and the time now that we are recording this episode, mm-hmm. we have had two different people on Facebook contact us to make requests similar to this. Yeah. The first was Demi, who is also a patron. Hi, Demi. Who? Who specifically said, can you guys do an episode about Jurassic Park? Well, okay. And the second was Nick, who said, uh, who, who asked if we were going to do episodes about paleontology and, and the popular media. So... Thanks, Demi and Nick. This isn't an episode specifically in response to you guys, so you let us know if this is what you want, and if it's not, then let us know what you do. Yeah, if, if there's any blanks we didn't fill in for you, well, I guess we could do a second episode. I guess we could just talk about this once or twice or forever. So, <laughs> before we get started today, there are a few announcements that we want to blow through. For starters, this is the first episode that will be released in the bleak December. So, Wonderful as a reminder to everybody, your monthly dose of the Common Descent podcast is brought to you in large part by the support we receive on Patreon. Yeah! Big thanks to all of our patrons, as usual. As if you would like to become a patron and support us in a financial sense, then please consider joining us on Patreon. You will get access to extra cool stuff, bonus mm-hmm. material, little behind-the-scenes status updates, things like that, and the Eternal gratitude of your humble hosts. Yes. But December is also special because December is the end of the year. Mm Mm-hmm. As we look forward to 2018, we want to hear from you, dear listeners, more than ever. We are sort of in the process of discussing, you know, what's the plan for 2018? Are we going to do anything different? Are we Mm going to change it up? And as has always been the case, this podcast is more than just two schlubs on the internet coming up with stuff. We want you to be part of it. So we want to know from you, what do you like about the Common Sense Podcast? Who are you? Why do you listen to us? Do you like the news section? Do you like the discussions? Do you come for the dorky jokes? Is there stuff that we have done in the past that you'd like to see us do more of? Is there something that we haven't done that you'd like to see? Do you have any suggestions for us as we move forward with the podcast? We want this thing that we have created to grow and build, Mm -hmm. and it is more than a two-person job. Yes, very much so. We could come up, we we 
have ideas all the time of how we could improve it, but we are but two people. There's yes. bound to be things you'll think of that we do not. So please let us know. Yes, and we want this to be the best podcast that it can be, and a podcast does it does not work without an audience. Uh, if, if a pod, if there's no one to listen to a podcast, doesn't make sense. <laughs> if, if you cast a pod in the forest <laughs> and no one is there to hear it. All right, let's move on to the main event after the news. Will? Well, today in the news, I have my first article is about a sauropod trackway. Uh, but not just any sauropod trackway, the longest in the world. Whoa. Yeah, now for everyone, when I say trackway, these are a series of dinosaur footprints and yes. that have been preserved in stone, which is not wholly uncommon, but this one's significant for its quality. It was pretty well preserved in most areas and the size of it. So this is a number of sauropods that were moving through an area and left behind a track of prints that stretch in totality over 500 feet long. It's a big one. It's a lot of footprints. That's ridiculous. To use this standard measurement tool of, of the globe, that's almost two football fields. Yes. You know, we use that all the time. I've never played football, so it never helped. Um... <laughs> How many sauropods would fit in an Olympic-sized swimming pool? <laughs> yes. So this. So the sauropods right. are the long neck, long tail. Absolutely, your guys. Skinny, just for people who. You know, small head at the end, big body in the middle. Yes. This track was found in France, uh, among the mountains there, and these are the Jura Mountains that the Jurassic is actually named after. Yeah, and just like that one movie. Yeah, and they date it roughly. 150 million years old. Mm -hmm. Fun fact, it was discovered a little while back in 2009 by an amateur geologist group who focuses on Jurassic Age rocks. Cool. Which is neat. Yeah. Now, the study was actually written up more recently. It's in GeoBios, and it's by uh, Jean-Michel Mazin et al. And they marked it out and, and just kind of recorded all the info they could on it. And it brought up some cool things. First is there's over a hundred paces, actual footprints cool. preserved in it, about a hundred and ten. And they got good enough footprints to see the foot shape of these sauropods. And they're different front and back. Not you know, not too weird. Back feet have five little round toe nubs, like think of your elephant feet, just little toe bumps mm -hmm. around a round foot. And then the front feet, this is more interesting, we went over the, mentioned this a little bit in our dinosaur episode, but the front feet doesn't have toes because it doesn't, they're, they're walking literally on the ends of the bones, so it has five circular finger marks in an <laughs> arc around where the foot pad would be. Yeah, that classic horseshoe shaped sauropod footprint. Yeah, it's really, it's, so it's literally just a, com, a column on the front. Yeah. Now, trackways are cool, but you can't, there's lots you can't tell about dinosaur footprints. First off, species is something you can never truly determine. You can get yeah. category a lot of the times. You may be able to get more specific to a grouping of dinosaurs due to features, but you'll never be able to get the species. Uh, they actually have to get named separately because if the mud was super wet or the dinosaur had an injury or it was running or it you know tripped, you can't know mm -hmm. that the footprint's actually representing the right foot. And there's soft tissue around it, so that's always going to disrupt what it looks like from bone to uh, print. What they could tell, though, was some cool things they did with biometrics. Now, a lot of these aren't going to be 100% because you're extrapolating from the footprint, but they got mm -hmm. some cool uh, estimates. General size of the animals, they're ranging 115 feet, 35 to 40 tons, so diplodocus sized. Yeah. You know, big. Decent sized sauropods. These are not. These aren't. That's, yeah, that's big. <laughs> these are these are these are big ones. And so big sauropods. The cool part was they were able to calculate the stride and from that get a rough speed estimate. Yeah. Which is really cool. So the stride was about nine point two feet, two point eight meters. So that's almost a ten foot step. <laughs> <laughs> wow. That's a step across the room. It's exactly like that's. 
a ridiculous that could go make it past a lot of cars. <laughs> yeah. <laughs> <laughs> and at that with that step they were going at just about two and a half miles per hour. Cool. That's it's super neat because whenever you do something like size estimates, there's mm-hmm. always that caveat where, yeah, okay, we're comparing this to known specimens yes. and it's a general estimate of what the size might have been, we know from the skeletons. But walking pace and mm-hmm. speed is a much more direct calculation. And so that's a really fun thing that you can get from trackways that you can't get from skeletons mm-hmm. alone. It's That's my favorite thing about things like trackways and other odd remnants of you know, dinosaurs and other fossil animals is that though this cannot tell us specifically which sauropod it was or what it looked like other than the shape of its feet, it can tell us things the bones can't. So it's it's that nice, uh, you know, overlay. As you add more layers, it fills in the picture. Yeah. And I like that. Cool. Ooh. Moving on. My mm-hmm. first bit of news is a little bit cheating. Hmm? Because it has to do with stromatolites, one of the most famous types of fossils in the world. Ah. Except that the stromatolites in the this particular study are not fossils. Ooh, what intrigue! All right, now now that I have you hooked, the the background information. <laughs> We've talked about stromatolites on the podcast before. The most ancient evidence of life on Earth comes in the mm-hmm. form of stromatolites from over three point five billion years ago. Yes, stromatolites are a structure formed in, of sediment that happens when you have a mat basically this gooey, tiny carpet of microbes, Mm -hmm. usually bacteria, especially in the past, that are just sort of in this sheet. And as they live there and as they thrive there, they're collecting sediment that washes over them, or they might be excreting minerals. Mm -hmm. And over time, that layer of minerals cements around those cells while the new generation of cells grows on top of them. Yeah. So what you get over time are these stacked layers Mm -hmm. of cemented mineral where that bacterial mat used to be. Very much like a coral reef, but not uh, structural in their purpose. Just Yeah, it's just a leftover. Mm -hmm. Stromatolites were extremely common in the Archean and the Proterozoic before Mm -hmm. the Cambrian explosion happened. But when the Cambrian came along, so too did animal grazers, like snails, that like to eat the algae from these mats, or the bacteria, or whatever it is. So stromatolites since then are very rare, including today. They're still around today. This study found some in an unexpected place in Tasmania. Hey. This is an area within the Tasmanian Wilderness World Heritage Area a protected region, thank goodness, in a study in Scientific Reports by Bernadette Proemzi et al. This is an area of natural springs where you get these mounds that are built from the the sediment and minerals that are deposited by Mm -hmm. the spring water. But what's unusual about them is that this is not the typical kind of place you would find these sorts of bacterial colonies. Some of the most famous places for stromatolites today, like Shark Bay, Australia, the water is hyper salty. Yeah. And the reason stromatolites are able to live there is because that super saltiness means that snails and stuff can't. Yes. They might live in places where it's extremely hot or something like that. They've they've survived as, as extremophiles. Yes, exactly. But these in Tasmania are not living in a super salty or super hot or something environment. So these researchers were really interested to know why they were able to survive around these spring mounds. Mm -hmm. And what they found when they took a close look was the areas where the stromatolites are living is in this calcium-rich mud. And they suspected that the high amounts of calcium carbonate in the mud might pose a problem to things like snails because that can get on the shells and can Mm -hmm. interfere with their function. And it seems that they were right, as evidenced by the fact that the edge of the the mud areas were full of snail shells from dead snails. (laughs) (laughs) 
So the stromatolites were living in these sort of bands of safe havens of calcium-rich mud where the snails just couldn't make it. Oh, that's awesome. And this, the researchers say, is really interesting, not only because that's cool, but this is a habitat that they didn't expect to see stromatolites in. Right. And DNA analysis shows that the combination of microbes that are making up these colonies are unique compared to other stromatolites. Hmm. So these stromatolites, and I guess these are more accurately called stromatolite-forming colonies, since the stromatolite, yeah. I think, is specifically the layered sediment. Stromatolites. Str stromato stromato I don't know. Lurs. Stromatolites. Stromatolers. <laughs> <laughs> so this could mean that there might be more stromatolites out there in places we haven't thought to look. That's super cool. Yeah, still going strong, 3.5 billion years later. I like discoveries like this because it's, it's always cool when you have a moment where you you find something that, it, you know, it's cool in and of itself if it's found in an unusual place, but now opens your eyes to now have other places to potentially look. You know, yeah. discovering them here could, there you know, it might be very easy to go, oh, well, there's, I know of half a dozen places very similar to this that yep. we just never went hunting for stromatolites in. And that's that's really cool how it, it you just didn't know to look before. They might have been there the whole time. Absolutely. Exciting stuff. Very cool. So my second news piece is uh this is not this is a fun one because it's about a fossil gliding mammal. Ooh. Yeah, which is pretty neat. So gliding mammals, uh which we all know today have shown up in the fossil record before. This one is not super unique for the fact that it's gliding, but it has a couple of other interesting caveats to its uh, features and discovery. Yeah. Uh, this is by uh, Gang Han et al. in Nature, and it was a Chinese fossil. They actually have two specimens of this one, and they've described it and discovered a couple of interesting things. Now, this these are small little gliding mammals about mouse size they said mm -hmm. so you know not not very big they got the typical membrane between the arms and the legs that flap of skin yeah. that you think of when you picture a flying squirrel or you know any most of the other gliding mammals around today and that's preserved in the fossil it is and so they have a you can see the skin membrane in the fossil that's uh, as awesome. well as fur and everything and so they're able to see that membrane one between the front arms and the neck, and one between the back legs and the tail, which cool. they can see was long and bushy. The tail? Yeah. Neat. Once again, like many modern gliders, they have bushy tails to help them steer while they glide. Very, very neat. Yeah. So it's it's a very recognizable glider. You know, it's it's looks a lot like what we would expect to see in a gliding mammal today. Now, this fossil specimen uh, is named Arboro Haramia Allen Hobson, Hobson I. Cool. And fun thing about the species name, uh, Alan Hobson is actually named after two mammal specialists, I believe, that which is Alan and uh, Hobson, uh, that they wanted to pay tribute to in the naming. Very nice. Yeah. And they spe they specialized in mammal middle ear bones because hmm. this animal has preserved... One of the specimens is almost com complete, and it has even preserved those bones. Interesting. These are the iconic, like, no other group of animals has these. Yes. Those identifying mammal characters, those inner those ear bones. three little bones in between your eardrum and, and uh, inner ear that transmit the sound in such detail that gives us such acute sense of hearing. Yeah, the, the hammer, the anvil, and the other one. Yeah, the hammer, the anvil, and the, the stove. And um, the Santa Maria. Yes. <laughs> so these are really well-preserved specimens. And before I talk more about the ear, I wanted to mention really quick, they were able to look at the dentition and see that it was probably eating insects, fruits, and seeds. So once again, pretty varied, mm -hmm. normal diet. This ear is where it really becomes interesting. All mammals today have three of those ear bones, the middle yes. ear bones. Fossil mammals that we find also have three middle, middle ear bones, which draws us to the conclusion that it's probably a very ancestral trait. Mm -hmm. This little glider throws that for a loop because it has five. What? 
five little ear bones. What are you even doing? And where'd you steal those inner ear bones from? <laughs> where'd you where did you, where did you get these? <laughs> Don't you lie to me. <laughs> so the this is interesting because uh, typically the the path of evolution that was drawn for the middle ear bones is that reptiles have lots of extra bones in their jaw, it mm-hmm. makes it very flexible and malleable, and mammals have just one bone in the their bottom jaw, and these middle ear bones developed from those extra reptilian bones. Yes, as as those back jaw bones mm-hmm. sort of receded, yep. the mammalian line co-opted them into those inner ear bones. They got repurposed. And this is also part of one, one of the reasons that it was assumed, or when it, why it was thought that it was a very ancestral trait. You know, all lines were pointing to that this happened mm-hmm. from the transition of mammals, or reptiles to mammals, and then we've kept it since then. This does not show that, so that either... The number has changed. It hasn't been consistently three, or it's developed multiple times. Weird. Which is super weird for something <laughs> that we thought was kind of a, a a easy shot for standard mammal trait. Yeah. Very interesting. It's pretty cool. This also this mammal also suggests a big thing for this is a Jurassic mammal. Mm-hmm. They date it to about 164 to 159 million years ago. Yeah. So this is before. Modern mammal diversity. This is when mammals were diverse, but, you know, shadow of the dinosaurs kind of time. Under the boot heel of the reptilian overlords. Yes. Like many people think we are still today. But that's a whole... <laughs> <laughs> we don't talk about that on this podcast. They're going to shut us down. Yes. <laughs> this is the podcast is going to be taken down. <laughs> <laughs> this actually brings in a very interesting addition to that mammal diversity question. Because modern gliders are... are Fairly diverse. There's like 64 species. Mm -hmm. They're all nocturnal, so we can, you know, uh, draw a lot of the conclusions that this glider probably was too. But like I said, it looks very much like a modern glider. Mm -hmm. It has complex inner ear bones. So this suggests that mammals were diversifying a lot more than we had been giving them credit for way before dinosaurs went extinct. Oh, yeah. You know, 100 million years before dinosaurs were even thinking of going extinct. (laughs) Mammals were already getting pretty complex so we may have to rethink our whole notion that mammals were just staying you know fairly fairly simple and small some of them were getting pretty crazy yeah that's something that has been a trend because for a long time that was the assumption was like oh yeah they they were like little mousy things and that was it until the dinosaurs moved out of the way but we keep finding gliders and aquatic Mm -hmm. mesozoic mammals and all sorts of this this interesting almost hidden mammal diversity. Yeah. There's even been a couple of not big, but not small predatory mammals and things like that. Yeah. And so it's it's a cool one, you know, cool little mammal with some big, you know, if not ground-shaking, definitely eye-opening uh, traits. Yeah. Which is cool. Very interesting. Yes. Finally, I turn your attention to the final news piece, and if you thought I was cheating with that last one, this piece of news is about tech. <laughs> this isn't even really it. about fossils. <laughs> Federico Fonti et al. published a study in P3, which is what we call that journal when we don't want to say paleogeography, paleoclimatology, and paleoecology. <laughs> yeah. <laughs> in that journal, they published this study about a piece of equipment that they are hoping to use to revolutionize an aspect of fossil identification. Specifically, or at least one of the major uses of this, would be to help with the issue of fossil poaching. Oh. So poaching's a big deal. People, it's very common for people to collect fossils illegally from areas they're not supposed to, and then for those fossils to show up a lot of times in auctions or on a market somewhere. Yeah. This is extremely common these days in places like the Gobi Desert in China and mm-hmm. Mongolia. And there's been a lot of high-profile cases of this. Nicolas Cage had a Tarbosaurus skeleton yes. recently that ended up being returned to Mongolia because it was stolen. It because was illegally poached. A lot of the times, you know, these specimens are end up broken. Mm-hmm. But one of the biggest issues is that once they're removed, we don't know where they came from. This is a problem scientifically because... The location tells us about the age and the environment, but also because if you're the Mongolian government 
and you're trying to figure out if this is a stolen fossil, the fossil doesn't have a tag on it that says made in from the Gobi Desert. You know, you have to at, rely on expertise. Mm -hmm. Except that maybe it does. These researchers used a portable X-ray fluorescence scanner, Ooh. which characterized the geochemical signature of rocks and fossils on site in the Nemet Formation in the so Gobi Desert. Doesn't send a picture back with the skeleton all laid out nice. No, it doesn't. Shotgun yeah. shell. And... A few more years of this technology, we won't have to dig anymore. <laughs> Where's the fun in that? So they basically what this allowed them to do was figure out the barcode, if you will, of the chemistry of this particular formation. Then they took it to the Mongolian Academy to test it on the fossils there, and they found that the fossils that were dug up from that site matched the geochemical signature of the site. Oh, nice. Which is so excellent. Cool. They're planning to do more tests on this. They're, they're planning to do more studies. But if this continues to work, it will mean, A, right, for, for poaching cases, that authority people and paleontologists might be able to just scan fossils and say, all right, yeah, this came from the Nemet Formation. Mm -hmm. That's where it belongs. Or to use a more dramatic example, sir, this came from the Nemet Formation. You're under arrest. <laughs> yes, yes. <laughs> uh, it could also be really useful for cases, not illegal cases, but instances where a fossil is just missing location data for some reason. Yeah. Like if it were, if it was collected by, you know, construction or, or by someone who wasn't thinking about location for some reason or who hadn't learned or moved by mm -hmm. accident or for who knows how many reasons we can lose that information. That's very cool. It's literally a chemical ID tag. Yes. Which is, I mean, it, this it's a huge deal because not only is it a very quantitative way to connect a fossil to its location, but it's also like, that's a database we can build up, you know, scanning yeah. more and more sites and comparing and... Yeah, it could be, it could be as simple as you know you you literally have the the scanner in in the future it'll just search the database. Yeah, it's like a fossil go, fingerprint database. Exactly, and it'll just bring it up and go, oh, it looks like it matches most closely this part of the globe. Yup, which is really cool. That's some really exciting stuff. Hooray for technology! Yeah, cool. Very cool. And now our feature presentation. Yeah. You ready? I'm excited. Cool. Everybody get ready. Hold on hold to your butts. On. Yeah, hold on to your butts. <laughs> <laughs> so, before we get to talking about Jurassic Park, the movie, let's do a little bit of background on just dinosaurs and their relationship with film. Oh. Because, as it turns out, dinosaurs have been in movies for as long as there have been movies. Yep. This relationship goes back very, very far. So we start way back in the 1800s, actually. Dinosaur paleontology gets its start in largely throughout the 1800s. The word dinosaur is coined in 1842, yeah. especially in the late 1800s, especially in North America. We see the discovery of a lot of the dinosaurs that are super famous today. Yeah. Mm -hmm. Diplodocus, Triceratops, Stegosaurus, Apatosaurus. These are dinosaurs being dug up by famous people like Cope and Marsh. Yes. And it's around the turn of the century, around the early 1900s, that museums really start to get in the habit of putting dinosaur skeletons up on display. Mm -hmm. It's also in the early 1900s that the film industry really gets its start. Yes. The earliest dinosaurs in movies are already in there by the early 19-teens. Mm -hmm. There is a movie called Primitive Man, which features a very short sequence of a theropod dinosaur just sort of standing there chewing on something while cave people run around flailing at its feet. Yeah. More famous than that is Gertie the Dinosaur. Gertie! Have you heard of Gertie the Dinosaur? Absolutely. Gertie's one of my favorites. <laughs> Gertie is a short animated film about a animated sauropod, Brontosaurus, mm -hmm. at that time, and maybe now again, who knows. 
Gertie is interesting because Gertie is apparently the first popular named animated character in film. Yes. Mm -hmm. Was a dinosaur. Yeah. Like it was the first animated character like that actually had a name and a personality and a yeah. persona. Like not just random little clown doing a dance. It actually had a character. Yeah. That's pretty cool. Gertie is in public domain, by the way, so you can look up Gertie and watch the whole short video. For anyone who might be Disney fans, if you go to Hollywood Studios or MGM, depending on what age you were when you first went, around the little pond in the middle, Gertie's the dinosaur with all the snow on her back and standing next to the, like, the ah. hot dog stand or the snow cone stand. <laughs> Gertie's there. That's Gertie. And so that's awesome. Like, she's And that's the reason she's there is it's it's an homage to her her history in Hollywood. That's super cool. Mm -hmm. Dinosaurs were not only at the forefront of 2D animation. They were also at the forefront of stop motion animation. Yes. Through the early 1900s, there is, there's a bunch of different movies that come out with dinosaurs in animation. A lot of them are done by this guy named Willis O'Brien. And if you're mm -hmm. a movie fan, you might know that name because he's kind of famous. Mm -hmm. He really, his work really sort of breaks the mold in 1925. With The Lost World. Yeah. The Lost World is sort of the first big dinosaur movie. Mm -hmm. It's feature length. You know, it's a long movie. It's about a group of people that go to a plateau isolated in South America where time stood still. And there's still all sorts of prehistoric creatures running around. There's the famous T-Rex brontosaurus fight on top of the cliff. Mm-hmm. And all sorts of cool stuff happens in that movie. Cutting edge stop motion animation by Willis O'Brien, which is surpassed by himself again in 1933 with another dinosaur movie that is also one of the most iconic movies of all time. This is a movie that is, has lots of dinosaurs, although the star of the movie is a giant gorilla. Yep. This is King Kong. Absolutely. And King Kong also has a ton of iconic dinosaur scenes. Your T Rex mm -hmm. fighting King Kong. You've got my favorite scene, which is the Brontosaur in the river. Yes, yep. I love it. It's super cool. Mm -hmm. They got the a really awesome scene with a, a stegosaur that the the characters actually like walk down the length of the body. And so it does this like big long close up. And so I mean, yeah, it get, you get like really yeah. cool scenes of. And, like, you know, not just glimpses, but long, drawn-out, beautiful scenes of dinosaurs. Yeah. And what's really interesting when you look at these dinosaurs in the earliest decades of film is they follow a lot of the conventions of the science at the time. Mm-hmm. Right? The bipeds stand up like kangaroos with their tails on the ground. Yeah. Yeah which is how museums were reconstructing their skeletons back then. Sauropods often show up in swamps. Mm -hmm. uh, Charles R. Knight, the famous paleo artist, drew a very iconic image, well, made a very iconic image, of sauropods dwelling in swamps, because mm -hmm. that was a popular way to depict them back then. Yeah, They also have a lot of those very reptilian characteristics. Uh, one, one of the coolest sort of iconic images is in King Kong, the T-Rex's tail. Yep. That snaky, you know, whipping mm -hmm. back and forth motion that it makes. Yeah, it's very serpentine. Yes. And a lot of the dinosaurs that show up in the movies are the dinosaurs that were famous at the time, especially the ones that were getting popular museum mounts, mm -hmm. like what was called Brontosaurus, like T-Rex, like Stegosaurus, things like that. Yeah, the celebrities. The celebrity dinosaurs. But the movies also had a tendency to do their own not very scientific thing. Dinosaurs for a very long time in movies have been depicted as monsters rather than mm -hmm. as, you know, creatures, like living animals. Mm -hmm. Also, most of the movies from early days of film, and even later days of film, tend to either do the Lost World thing, where it's a mm -hmm. land or an island where time stood still, or they do the Flintstones thing, where it's yep. just, this is a movie about cavemen, so there are dinosaurs in it. 
mm-hmm. that was what that that early early you know primitive man did that. But then also like one million BC did that, and the remake of one million BC did that, and lots <laughs> and lots of famous. Just to to drive home the the monster aspect and the fact of there's only so many ways for people to interact. Uh, the most iconic movie monster ever, Godzilla, was supposed to be some sort of ancient dinosaur or aquatic reptile. They're very vague on it, but I mean even. Like, <laughs> yeah, that was that was the the view of these creatures back then. And even in the ori- I think this was in the original Godzilla. Correct me if I'm wrong, but there's a scene where they find its footprint or something early on, mm-hmm. and there's a trilobite in it. Yes, and that's another one of the sort of that prehistoric melting pot of all mm-hmm. prehistoric creatures are come from the same time. They just represent ancient. It was supposed to be, like, parasites on his skin, and yeah, it was just, like, a, a weird-looking trilobite. Yelv? Mm-hmm. It's super interesting to look at the way the movies depicted science back then. One of my favorite examples is 1940, Disney's Fantasia. Mm-hmm. Mm-hmm. Featured a sequence called The Rite of Spring, which was the history of the Earth, but it's famous for this extended dinosaur sequence. Yep. And it mixes dinosaur. You know, it's got T Rex fighting Stegosaurus, and the T Rex has three fingers. Because I think mm-hmm. it, this may have been before we found T Rex arms. Yeah. <laughs> but the sequence ends with the extinction of the dinosaurs, and it's this sequence where it's like volcanoes and earthquakes and droughts, mm-hmm. because we didn't know why the dinosaurs went extinct. It's just like these biblical events of just the yeah. Earth turning traitor on the dinosaurs, and that's <laughs> that was it. Because <laughs> it was. Decades before, you know, we knew about the asteroid. It was before we we really understood the Deccan traps. So they didn't have that stuff. Yeah. This imagery was sort of the dominant way to picture dinosaurs for the first half of the 1900s. Mm-hmm. Then, over in the paleo community, there was this series of events known as the Dinosaur Renaissance. Ooh. Starting in the 1960s, with a man named John Ostrom and the best dinosaur of all time, Deinonychus. Yee. Deinonychus is a small, wolf-sized, predatory, quote, raptor dinosaur. More on that word later. <laughs> and what was really interesting about Ostrom's study of Deinonychus was that he made a very big point to say, this is an active, high-energy, hmm. predatory animal. It's very bird-like in a lot of its features, Mm -hmm. and these descriptions kind of sparked a lot more new discussion about dinosaur relationships and dinosaur metabolism and dinosaur activity and dinosaur behavior. And over the 70s and 80s, there were a bunch of new discoveries like nesting sites in the Western Mm -hmm. United States. And there were a bunch of new techniques like computer algorithms that could help us arrange evolutionary relationships. And over the course of these decades, this dinosaur renaissance, our image of dinosaurs changed dramatically. Yeah. More active animals, more social animals, much more bird-like because we finally began to understand the, the, the reality of their connection to modern-day birds. Mm-hmm. At some point in this time, we finally pulled their tails up off the ground yeah. so that they weren't breaking their hips, and we pulled the sauropods out of the swamps because it didn't make sense when we actually looked at it, the, uh, the scientific evidence for it. It's very cool. Like These changes were happening fairly recently to the point of I had books as a kid with a mm-hmm. very, with still very old images, you know. I mean, a lot of my books, Stegosaurus had a single row of plates yeah. and things like that. I mean, it was within our lifetime that a lot of these things have taken final hold in both the scientific and especially public, commu- you know, eye of the updated, you know, quote unquote, form of dinosaurs. Yes, and what's really interesting is that, you know, there's always a little bit of a disconnect between the latest in science and the the sort of public Mm -hmm. demonstration, the way that they're reconstructed in the public. Dinosaurs in movies kind of stayed mostly the same throughout the dinosaur renaissance. Mm -hmm. They were still, you know, Godzilla, and 
the remake of One Million Years B.C. and Valley of the Guanji and when dinosaurs ruled the Earth and all these other movies that were still sort of doing the classic look of Mm -hmm. dinosaurs. And so there was this lag period between the discovery of these new, this updated vision of dinosaurs and it really making a splash in the public eye. Mm -hmm. And then... 1993 came along, and with it came Jurassic Park. Woo! Jurassic Park, for those of you who have not seen Jurassic Park, if you've managed to not see Jurassic Park... Shame on you. (laughs) (laughs) Jurassic Park was based on a book. It's not exactly like the book. In the movie Jurassic Park, the synopsis goes like this. An eccentric rich guy hires an entire company to find DNA Mm -hmm. from insects in amber that allows them to resurrect dinosaurs through magical cloning technologies Mm -hmm. that he then makes the star attractions in his zoo slash theme park on an island off the coast of Costa Rica. Mm -hmm. The first thing that he does with this theme park right before it opens is he invites a bunch of people to come look at it. Two paleontologists, a mathematician, Chaotician, Chaotician, actually. Chaotician. A lawyer and his grandkids, mm-hmm. or at the very least, his favorite grandkids. <laughs> <laughs> I guess he only has the two. <laughs> because this was originally a Michael Crichton novel, the science gets the better of them, the technology fails, and things go horribly, horribly wrong. Yes. Jurassic Park is really interesting in its depiction of dinosaurs, in part because it shows them in a much more updated way way. Yeah. It is one of the first, you know, it's not the first movie to do any of these things in, in the mo- for the most part, but it is the first movie to do all of these things mm-hmm. in a very obvious way. The dinosaurs hold their tails off the ground. Yeah. Their spine, the neck through tail is horizontal like we know that they were. Mm-hmm. The dinosaurs are social, yep. right? They do move in herds. They are active. They are intelligent, right? The velociraptors, quote, velociraptors, Mm -hmm. in Jurassic Park are almost unique in dinosaur movies for being scary, not because they're big and clunky and strong, but because they're smart and they're cooperative. They made them much, very much like wolves. Yes. And over and over and over again, the movie harps on the link between dinosaurs and birds. Mm Mm-hmm. It's not the first movie that I know of to imply a connection between dinosaurs and birds, but it's by far the first one to really commit to it. Yes. So it shows the dinosaurs in this much more updated, right? It sort of brings the dinosaurs of the Renaissance to the public eye, Mm -hmm. which is not to say that all of the science in the movie is good. Yes. Because it's not. (laughs) In fact, it's far from it. Bless me. The raptors are far too big to be Velociraptor. They're even too big to be Deinonychus, which is what they were actually based off of in the first place. Mm -hmm. The hands of the theropod dinosaurs are in that classic pronated position where the palms face down. The, I'm creeping up upon you hand Yes, (laughs) the sort of limp wrist with the claws dangling over, Mm -hmm. which they couldn't do. Their Mm -hmm. wrists were locked, essentially, so that the palms faced towards each other. Yep. Clapping motion. Mm-hmm. And then there's just a bunch of dinosaur stuff in this movie that is either speculative or just sort of artistic license mm-hmm. or might be true, but not really held up by the evidence. Yes. Like the whole T-Rex vision is based on movement, mm-hmm. which is definitely not true yep. now. And I, it wasn't really thought to be true back then. The Dilophosaurus has the frill and it spits venom, mm-hmm. which There's no evidence for that whatsoever. That's just artistic creation. The raptors are really interesting because pack hunting is a long-favored hypothesis, Mm -hmm. but the evidence for pack hunting in raptor dinosaurs is not actually really very supportive of that. Uh, Also, the claw, the way they're they're described using their claws – there's right, that famous scene in the beginning of the movie where Dr. Grant scares the heck out of the kid. By describing 
Each slash. And he <laughs> slashes across the belly. We never actually get to see them do that. Nope. <laughs> in the movie, and there's evidence to suggest that they couldn't do that in the first place. Well, and it's it's one of those things where I, I used to wonder that even as a kid when I'd look... And I think of this... I, I would think of this all the time and stuff, and, you know, when they would show a creature in a movie slash at something with its claws and leave these, like, katana cuts across it. But then I'd look at my cat's claws or Mm -hmm. the raptor's claws and be like, but there's only one sharp part. (laughs) It's not a blade. It's a hook. And if you watch how cats use their claws when they're hunting, they're not ripping the gazelle to ribbons. (laughs) They're grabbing it. And so it's one of those where they're describing a hook being used in a non-hook way, which is always confusing to me when they... Loved that scene, but I, there, as a little kid, I'm like, but would it? <laughs> <laughs> so, yeah, Jurassic Park gets its science messy. Mm-hmm. Uh, and that's not to mention, like, the DNA stuff, oh, yeah, which yeah, doesn't yeah. work. You can't clone extinct animals, even if you could get dinosaur DNA, which you can't. Uh, just general animal stuff. Yeah. Like the, 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 <laughs> the, um, the T-Rex shaking... Mm-hmm. the ground with the footprints thing which is silly yep <laughs> like how do you sneak up on your prey yeah if your prey always knows that you're coming it's, it's a fun movie tactic but it's not a very good biological strategy it's i mean it's it's one of those things where you know that has to mean that every time you're in the vicinity of the t-rex compound it has to be sleeping or otherwise it's rumbling every time you're even if it's out of sight if he's moving <laughs> <laughs> you're gonna feel yeah like, <laughs> just pacing. Just just constant. It's also the biggest question that I've seen brought up on that is, uh, where was the rumbling at the end of the movie when he shows up through the yeah. empty wall? You know, that stuff. <laughs> <laughs> yeah. If we if we were going to talk about inconsistencies oh, in yeah. Jurassic Park and cinematic, cin- cinematic graphic errors, we would be here all day. Yep. So Jurassic Park did some really cool stuff scientifically. Yeah. It introduced the public to a more updated view of dinosaurs. It also introduced the public to a lot of wrong things about dinosaurs. Mm -hmm. It gets a lot of its science wrong. And this stuff wouldn't be, I think, nearly as interesting if Jurassic Park wasn't such a big deal movie. Yeah, exactly. Much like we mentioned before uh, with Gertie and with the early claymation stuff, Jurassic Park, once again, dinosaurs are at the forefront of a revolution in technology. Mm -hmm. In animation, this is one of the first movies to really hit it big with CGI. Yeah. They did phenomenal stuff with animatronics mixed in with that as well. Uh, In fact, and you, sir, can correct me if I'm wrong on this, Mm -hmm. I have heard it cited that one Mr. George Lucas has stated that Jurassic Park seeing the the level of CGI in movies, including Jurassic Park, was one of the things that is said to have inspired him to move ahead with more Star Wars movies. Absolutely, because well, seeing that and what was visually possible was basically... And, and that you can see this line of thought in the re-releases where he keeps updating the visuals, but that was the first thing that made him go, maybe I can actually make my visions come true. Like, I have all this stuff in my head, yeah. but I didn't think it was possible. Maybe it is. And so, I mean, it it made some major changes in cinema. Interesting. So Jurassic Park is the reason that we got the Star Wars prequels. Yeah. So So thanks for that. Yeah. (laughs) (laughs) I've also heard that Peter Jackson has said very similar things Mm -hmm. about being inspired by by that new level of CGI in in movies like this to then go on and do Lord of the Rings. Mm -hmm. Uh, Jurassic Park actually got three Academy Awards. One of them was for visual effects. The other two were, were for sound. Mm-hmm, mm-hmm. And John Williams won a Grammy, as well he should. <laughs> yes. Uh, for that theme song you heard so wonderfully reproduced at the yes. beginning of the episode. <laughs> Couldn't even tell the difference. <laughs> <laughs> and Jurassic Park was, uh, shortly after it came out, became the highest grossing movie of all time. Mm-hmm. It held that record for four years until James Cameron took it and never let it go. (laughs) Greedy. Yeah, no one takes the record from James Cameron except James Cameron. (laughs) 
So this was a big deal move, right? This wasn't just a cool updated dinosaur movie. This was a major blockbuster. It is an enormously popular movie in a way that most movies don't achieve. Yes. A, si- a similar connection to that, you know, where the success of this movie is part of the reason these subjects are so interesting. This, you know, it's not the first time we've seen this, uh, in case any of you didn't know, work in an aquarium, if, if I forgot to mention that. Uh, <laughs> I, <laughs> the perception of sharks is very commonly, everyone knows that it relates back to Jaws, which mm-hmm. wouldn't be a problem if Jaws was not the original summer blockbuster. Yeah. Jaws was what started that term. <laughs> Jaws was the original. Yeah, if it were not the most popular shark movie ever, we probably wouldn't be having trouble with people still thinking sharks were monsters that <laughs> needed to be feared. <laughs> so it's the same issue here is the all the cool stuff, but also all the weird stuff gets amplified by that connection. Yes. Yeah, mm-hmm. absolutely. This this really it's it's a an iconic moment mm-hmm. in pop culture history. Absolutely. And it carried dinosaurs along for the ride. Although I, I would argue that it would probably not have been as successful if it wasn't about dinosaurs. Absolutely. I think they're 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 both factoring into that. that no, it's, it, it's it definitely it's carried a... dinosaurs along, but also I mean, yeah, it's got dinosaurs in it. There's a reason that dinosaurs have been on screen since we had screens. Yes. People love dinosaurs. <laughs> they're cool. They're big. They are what we had already designed of dragons and big monsters. They were real versions <laughs> yeah. of those things that actually <laughs> existed. So, I mean, they they were already superstars that were then put into a very well-made movie. So those are some of the facts, like the hard information mm-hmm. about Jurassic Park. But I do want to take a moment and just talk about why we like it so much. Mm-hmm. Go ahead, Will. What What is so cool about Jurassic Park? I think there's a number of things. One, like we mentioned, it is a really good movie. Like, just mm-hmm. from a film standpoint, it's got great actors. It's got awesome dialogue. It's got really memorable lines. Yeah. <laughs> the story is really... Like, I. this is one of those movies that the more times I go back and watch it, the more times I'm blown away by how many details there are in the story of, like... Yeah. Almost there's almost no event in that movie that you can go back and go, "Wait a minute, why didn't they just because there's a moment where it's like, "Oh yeah, didn't you hear the guy on the radio? The storm's coming. They've already evacuated everyone else. That's why there's only so many people in the like <laughs> they thought of everything. <laughs> yeah. They really put it out. And so it's a good movie that then has some you know, especially for the time, but even by nowadays standards, some of the prettiest looking dinosaurs that have ever oh, been on. Yeah. They're so cool looking and Fun, you know the the brachiosaurs get to be majestic, and the T Rex gets to be terrifying, mm-hmm. and the Velociraptors get to be you know sleek, and it's really just as a dinosaur fan, like I said, there's still not been a movie since then that has been that enjoyable to see them in. Yeah, absolutely. I think I would add to that one of the things that always really impresses me about it is how much respect the movie has for the dinosaurs. Yes, absolutely. Like, the dinosaurs are shown to be really awesome animals, Mm -hmm. and the protagonist of the movie, right, the main character, Dr. Alan Grant, spends the whole movie geeking out about how cool the dinosaurs are. Yeah. He falls over when he sees the brachiosaur, he gets all... Like, school kids smiley at the Triceratops. Mm-hmm. When they see the Gallimimus flock, and then they see the T-Rex, and he's like, look, look at how they change direction, just like a flock of birds evading a predator. And even later in the movie, when they're being chased by the Velociraptor, he takes a moment to stop and comment on how fascinating the Velociraptor is. Mm-hmm, mm-hmm. And that always was really impressive to me that this is a movie that, you know, these dinosaurs aren't just movie monsters and they're not just there to be props. They're fascinating animals and the characters feel that way about them. And it, it becomes really hard for you not to feel that way about them. Well, it's, it was nice in that fact as well, because 
you know, what really drove home the fact that they were just animals, even though the predators are being, you know, extremely aggressive. Mm -hmm. A lot of the dinosaurs they come across aren't. They're harmless, you know. Same as if you came across a deer that had no reason to be afraid of you, it's not going to attack you just because. Yeah, and Grant says that. Mm -hmm. He says they're not monsters, Lex. They're animals. Yep, yep. One of the cool things about this movie is the dinosaurs feel real realistic. The characters feel realistic. You know, mm -hmm. I I liked you, you and I have commented before on, that one of our favorite scientists is the one from Tremors because she often comments <laughs> yeah. on why they keep asking her information outside of geology because yeah. she's a geologist. <laughs> <laughs> but it, this movie does a really good job with that as well. Where there are there are plenty of moments where Doctor Sattler doesn't start hypothesizing on the animals because she's a paleobotanist you know mm -hmm. she knows them because she works you know with grant but sh she's commenting on the plants you know yep. he's commenting on the animals and malcolm is commenting on the system not you know he doesn't have a moment where he's like well thinking logically the animals should be you know they're not pulling this typical scientist bs that movies often do where <laughs> i'm a scientist therefore i can just hypothesize about things yeah yeah they have specialties. Yeah, they feel like the actual professionals that they're playing, and I, I always liked that. I believed those characters, and they, they never felt unrealistic. You know, they weren't always able to handle things because they were a scientist. You know, if a situation came up, they're like, oh, I don't know how to do that. <laughs> <laughs> Absolutely. It was, it was, it's, it's a, it for as ridiculous a scenario as it was, and I think this is what made it such a, it felt believable it felt realistic it felt grounded yeah which i like so that's enough of us our little jurassic park love fest there that's why we like it it's the best movie of all time if you disagree you're wrong no i'm kidding let us know what you think about yes. jurassic park but this ties in next to the legacy of jurassic mm -hmm. park we talked about what happened before jurassic park what was the effect of Jurassic Park. Absolutely. As often as people like to say that movies are entertainment and not education, mm -hmm. it is absolutely true that we learn from movies. Yep. Jurassic Park had a big role in revolutionizing the public understanding of dinosaurs. Mm -hmm. Just about every dinosaur that has featured in a movie since 1993 or on TV, or in a video game, is following the model of the Jurassic Park dinosaurs. Mm -hmm. The age of the kangaroo stance theropods was done. Completely. Like, we we upgraded. And on the one hand, that's really cool for science. Yeah, scientifically, people were finally imagining dinosaurs in a more right horizontal spines with the tails out mm -hmm. behind them as active as bird like mm -hmm. right that connection between dinosaurs and birds was now public maybe not fully understanding but at least people had that connection in their brains mm -hmm. even the language that we use raptors yeah. referred to birds of prey before 1993 yes <laughs> absolutely <laughs> like that's a terminology that this movie introduced into the lexicon. Uh, the news today still, like, Jurassic Park is the go-to dinosaur thing yeah. in, pop in popular media. Absolutely. If you read a news article, right, we talk about velociraptors and we talk about T-Rex. Every news article about anything dinosaur molecule related has to talk about dinosaur DNA. Yep. Which nicely leads into the other part of the Jurassic Park legacy. On the one hand, it's really nice that the movie sort of showed everyone, hey, this is how dinosaurs stood, and this is a new way to think about dinosaurs. It, a very drastic update. On the other hand, mm -hmm. a lot of the things that Jurassic Park got wrong are now household misconceptions about dinosaurs. They were taken because of all the other positive things and correct things in the movie, these were also taken as gospel. Yes. Or, and even if you didn't intend, like, even if you don't think of Jurassic Park, like, oh, no, that's, I learned from this. 
when you mm -hmm. think Velociraptor, if you are a member of the general public that saw the movie, that's what you imagine mm -hmm. for Velociraptor. When you, to this day, if you work in a museum and you talk to, pub to people about dinosaurs, you are surprising people <laughs> by telling them that Velociraptor was a two-foot-tall animal. Yes, exactly. Uh, things like the, the whole vision, can't T-Rex can't mm -hmm. see if you don't move thing, the spitting venom, even the, the DNA stuff. Mm -hmm. These are now public thoughts about dinosaurs that we end up having to correct when we do podcasts like this or when you do a yeah. documentary or anything like that. Well, and it's, you know, it's to the point where, you know, like you said, whenever fossil molecular studies or when mammoth DNA is, you know, b being being partially replicated and, you know, or, or study, anytime that it comes up, there now has to be a secondary conversation purely to answer the, well, oh, didn't they make some movies that told us we shouldn't mess with this stuff? <laughs> yeah. Yeah, comments that inevitably are going to come up, which is one of those things that, you know, it's not so much that that's not a conversation to be had, but it's only happening most of the time <laughs> because of those movies. Yeah. And it's it really, yeah, it shapes scientific discussion with the public. Yeah, <laughs> Almost absolutely. Almost every time it comes up. And it also, there's this extra layer of what Jurassic Park did, which is the nostalgia layer. Yes. Which means that not only is the Jurassic Park version of dinosaurs sort of the the go-to, right, the iconic image, it's really hard to get away from that because when you try to change it, people don't want to change it because they really like Jurassic Park and they really like their mental image of dinosaurs that they got from that movie. Yeah, they get defensive about they don't want you to change how T-Rex looks. You you better not put feathers on it because it didn't have feathers. <laughs> <laughs> yeah. In Jurassic Park. And that's a really, it's a fascinating phenomenon. Mm-hmm. It's that, it's that whole thing of, for you know, for many people, they like dinosaurs or they started thinking they were cool because of Jurassic Park. Mm -hmm. that, that, and they now love not dinosaurs in general, but Jurassic Park dinosaurs. And that's where this distinction is. Yes. Even if they say they like dinosaurs, it's that's typically what their meaning is specifically. I like that type of dinosaur. Yeah. I like that version. And this isn't unique to the Jurassic Park dinosaurs. There are people, no. you know, we, we're talking about Jurassic Park like it's this, you know, the end-all be-all of dinosaur movies. But mm -hmm. there are people who still today prefer the Godzilla-style dinosaurs mm -hmm. because that's their nostalgia. Absolutely. Uh, and, you know, we talked a lot about the science of Jurassic Park. We like to focus on the good science in Jurassic mm -hmm. Park because we grew up with the movie and we have our own nostalgia factor for it. Absolutely. <laughs> but if you go back to, like, you know, editorials and, and opinion pieces that were written when Jurassic Park came out, there are a lot of scientists who hated this movie <laughs> because of yeah. all the stuff that it got wrong. I mean, for them, it, it must have felt like a, a you know a huge step sideways. Yeah. Of, like, it's cool that you did that, but the fact you did this makes me almost as mad <laughs> as the other one made me happy. Yeah, so it's 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 a weird situation. Well, I mean, it's it's to the point where, you know, not only is it the public perception, but it's dinosaurs are marketed still in this way of, I, I saw a, a dinosaur display you know, where they had animatronics at a, at a local zoo and their Dilophosaurus would, would, did not have the frill, but it would spit. Yes. Stuff like, I mean, like, that's to where other companies are still mirroring these things. And and lots of people, want to, when these kind of subjects come up with Jurassic Park, will semi-defend it on, like, well, we can't know, you know, we can't find the fossil evidence to show that some of those features that they showed weren't there, you know, those weren't <laughs> fossilized. And it's whether or not, you know, on some of them, yes, we can, but on others, yeah. you're not wrong, but that doesn't make it not made up. <laughs> yes, that is still artistic license, which is to say it's speculation. Is that like you could <laughs> you could have put a lot of weird things into that that dinosaur's mouth and they all could have been equally 
as far or close to the right answer since it doesn't fossilize. <laughs> that doesn't mean that, that we should hold on to the spitting venom just because it was in a good movie. More on that a little later. Mm -hmm. But I do, that is a great segue, and I didn't even mean to bring this up, but I just pulled it up on my computer. Yes. Uh, there was a review. Well, I've discovered this a long, long time ago, and I saved it. When 1 million BC came out in 1940, mm -hmm. there was a review in the New York Times by B.R. Chrysler, mm -hmm. who said... Uh, he was he was praising the movie, which is unusual because most people didn't like that movie when it came out. A masterpiece of imaginative fiction. Quote, probably no more fanciful than the monsters which practicing paleontologists have been known to recreate from fossil thigh bones or less. <laughs> End quote. 1940. Yeah. This guy was doing the yeah. same. <laughs> like, how do you know what this is in the movie's... <laughs> Absolutely. I mean, but this is a this is a long-standing thought process. Well, it's there was a um, I think it was the Onion that one of my coworkers showed me. Funny article, basically saying that uh, scientists and for anyone who doesn't know, the Onion is a, a, a fake, funny news source. Yeah, they make satire. up satire news articles. It was paleontologists now believe that dinosaurs would huddle together and hug during times of stress. And then in the little <laughs> subheader, it said, though there's no evidence for this behavior, there's no evidence against it. And the scientist said, eh, who's it really hurting? And it's a nice thought. <laughs> <laughs> Seriously, more on that later, because otherwise I'm going to start <laughs> ranting. So Jurassic Park's legacy was not only with the public, Mm -hmm. It also had an impact on science. A lot of people today who are paleontologists will cite that one of the reasons they got into the field was because of this movie. Yeah. When the movie came out, there were, you know, museums and universities around the, the country got more people coming in, more students signing up for certain classes mm -hmm. because it spurred this widespread renewed interest in dinosaurs. It made di dinosaurs sexy again. Yes, it did. There was also, per you know, how related this was is maybe less so the scientists and more so the funding agencies. Mm -hmm. But there was a burst of DNA research in the 1990s looking for fossil DNA yeah. mm -hmm. going back much farther than, you know, we now know, right, late Ice Age, we can get DNA maybe mm -hmm. farther back. But there were tons of these claims in the 1990s of we found super ancient DNA, all of which have since been debunked. Yeah. But there's this bit, and it was getting attention. It was the kind of study that you could find support to do that if you had tried to submit a grant to get funding to look for dinosaur DNA in the 80s, probably wouldn't have been very uh, as easy to get. Yeah, absolutely. So Jurassic Park had an impact on the public. It had an impact on the scientific community. Uh, it has an impact on educators. Mm -hmm. because, And as we've already touched on, when a movie like this comes out, if you work in something similar to this, you know what you're going to be talking about for the next few months. Yep. Right. This is what people at the museum are going to ask you about, and it's going to come up over and over again. What's really interesting to me as sort of a, you know, bringing our timeline up to the present is that we haven't had another Jurassic Park in the sense of this phenomenon. Mm -hmm. You know, it's been 20 years since Jurassic Park came out, more than that, and the Jurassic Park dinosaurs were sort of this, uh, you know, here's dinosaurs of the dinosaur renaissance with the Hollywood spin of still not being really all that very accurate, but they're more accurate, they're a better idea, mm -hmm. and it updated sort of the public consciousness in a big way. Well, it's been a long time, and there's been a lot of research since then, mm -hmm. and we now know even more stuff, right? Jurassic Park wasn't perfectly accurate or even close when it came out and now it's even less accurate 
-hmm. because we know even more, right? Velociraptor, for example, it's kind of forgivable that Velociraptor is not covered in feathers in Jurassic Park because yeah. while that was speculated back then, we didn't know it. Mm -hmm. Now we know it. Now we know lots of stuff. And even the films that have taken up the mantle of the franchise, like mm -hmm. Jurassic World, are still sticking with that Jurassic Park formula. Like the Jurassic World dinosaurs are just Jurassic Park dinosaurs again. Absolutely. They haven't changed them at all. In fact, aside from, I think, one sentence in Jurassic World, which is a small throwaway exposition line that I probably audience members by and large don't remember hearing mm -hmm. about iron in fossils. I don't oh, right, remember right. there being any nods to the last 25 years of dinosaur research in the movie. Yeah. They're still stick, you know, they're, they're stuck in 1993 with their depiction of dinosaurs. Yeah. It's a franchise now. Yeah. Well, and, and that's sort of the point of Jurassic world. It's not a movie about, I often say Jurassic World wasn't a movie for people who like dinosaurs. It was a movie for people who like Jurassic Park. Exactly. And that's exactly, you know, it's that distinction again. Yep. And that's fine. You know, if, if that's what you want to be. So Jurassic Park follows in a long legacy. It was a big mm -hmm. deal. It left its own legacy. Uh, was there anything else that you wanted to mention before we get to the final question? No, I mean, it's it's... It's an, and like I said, I I already made the comparison, but I it keeps coming back to things like Jaws for me, where Jurassic Park had far more positives than Jaws did for its subject matter. But yeah. it's the same concept of, I have met people, I have talked with people at the aquarium whose literal entire knowledge of sharks was based off of the Jaws archetype. Yeah. They completely believed that they were eating machines that just... Eight made baby sharks, <laughs> <laughs> and that's that's literally what some people still believe today, you know. And it's not their fault they they aren't biologists; they're not doing the research. But that movie has served as the base public knowledge, and Jurassic Park has done the same thing for dinosaurs in many ways. Which any time that a movie is your sole reference for a subject, usually ends up in the long run not being. The greatest, <laughs> yeah. Whether, whether you think about it or not, you're gonna you take lessons from. You're going to accidentally or on purpose draw conclusions from films, and especially when they're iconic. Absolutely, and Jurassic Park is among the most iconic films. This mm -hmm. it was a big deal, and it really affected paleontology, the process, right, the mm -hmm. actual science, and then also how the public interacts with that science. It's a absolutely cornerstone of science communication in paleontology, in genetics, and mm -hmm. all over the place. This leads into the final piece that I wanted to address. And this is springboarding off the Jurassic Park topic a little bit, but it's something that comes up a lot, and I wanted to open it up for discussion. Mm -hmm. Just in, you know, in the time that we have left in the episode. And that is the question of how much does it actually matter if movies are scientifically inaccurate. Yeah. And we could talk about this forever and ever and ever, but... And if you sign up on Patreon, <laughs> we There's may just There's a good do that. chance. <laughs> <laughs> it's very possible you might hear us ramble about this for a while. <laughs> but for now, quick, we'll get an answer from you, I'll give my answer, and mm -hmm. then this is also something that we would love for you, dear listener, to think about and share your thoughts on. Oh, please do. Please do. Does it matter? And if so, how much if movies are scientifically inaccurate? Will? This subject, I think, is kind of a, a, a two-pronged one where movies are entertainment. They're art. Mm -hmm. They are the purpose. Of, you know, there's a reason we specify documentary from film because documentary are meant to be factual recountings of reality. Mm-hmm. Movies are supposed to be entertaining, and we get that. You know, uh, lots of people get their feathers ruffled when someone is nitpicking inaccuracies in movies too much because you you'll always have someone eventually go, "Yeah, but it's just a movie." Yep. 
which at its base I agree with. You mm-hmm. know, I, it's why I can enjoy a fantasy in a sci-fi movie and not expect it to actually have to have any scientific reality or any reality in it. <laughs> the issue is that it is fine for them to be inaccurate when you're acknowledging that it's all fake. Mm -hmm. But that is not the base reflex of a lot of people. They, if you see something in movies often enough, at some point you just kind of go, well, they wouldn't put it in if it wasn't true. (laughs) Yeah. Even if you know that's not right, even if you know that it's fake from the get go, everything, the sound a punch makes in movies is fake. Mm -hmm. (laughs) The sound a silencer (laughs) on guns makes in movies is fake. Things, I mean, Things as simple as the sound is lies. So, of course, everything else is. The one I always go to is the defibrillator. Yeah. In movies, the defibrillator is what you go to when someone has died. And mm-hmm. you are desperate and you're yelling at their corpse and you keep zapping them until they come back. That is not what a defibrillator does. <laughs> they do not restart hearts. I will say that again. The defibrillator, the little <laughs> clear, does not restart hearts. That's what CPR is for. <laughs> That's what you use CPR for is to compress the chest and pump the heart manually so that hopefully you'll at least keep them somewhat in good condition until they can be recessed or the heart will start pumping on its own. The defibrillator is to defibrillate. When your heart is fibrillating, you're having a heart attack. Yes. But every movie gets used, and I have had arguments with people defending <laughs> the life-restoring properties of a defibrillator, because, and their citing is, then why would they show it in every TV show ever? Because it's fake. Yeah. And so I think that's there. the issue is, is no movies do not need to be accurate, but because people inevitably are going to assume at some point that aspects are, my, my position is, then if you're trying to make a movie that feels realistic, make it more realistic. Interesting. It's that's why it's, it's that yeah, kind yeah, of two pronged. Yeah. It's art, so it doesn't need to be, but people are going to take it seriously by accident or on purpose at some point. And if that's not addressed, then you have people who are making potentially dangerous mistakes sometimes. <laughs> that's a I, I like your perspective because mm-hmm. I agree with it for the most part. And I think that my perspective to build on that mm-hmm. is first of all, I think that Right, like you said, movies are art, movies are mm-hmm. entertainment. That's the point. And it's also, I think, ridiculous to expect a movie to be perfectly accurate. Yeah. Not only because that's not the point of a movie, it's escapism. Yes. Like, if I want perfect representations of reality, I don't go to the movies. I get enough of that at work mm-hmm. and everywhere. And, you know, when it comes to something like dinosaurs, we don't know everything about dinosaurs, so some things you have to make up. Yeah, like what is it? Absolutely. What is, what did its eyes look like? I, yeah. we, we don't know that. What do they can't sound be like? You know, yeah. Yes, but like I said before, and like you said, we do learn from movies intentionally mm-hmm. or not. Velociraptor is a household name. It didn't. It wasn't a household name for the first seventy years that that word existed, but mm-hmm. now it is because of a movie. And I think that to go a step further from what you said. Yes, people learn from movies, but also, yes, it has an impact. Mm-hmm. Mm-hmm. Like what you were talking about with, you know, medical things, and I would love to know how many medical students have to oh. be untaught about how a defibrillator works. Mm-hmm. Because that's a real thing in, in education that it's not as simple as just saying, this is wrong, this is right. If someone has an ingrained idea in their head, Mm -hmm. it takes time to undo that, right? If you have it stuck in your head that dinosaurs were monsters instead of actual living animals, you're going to have a really hard time wrapping your head around dinosaur ecology and dinosaur behavior. And I've had conversations with people who really struggle trying to understand the sort of intricacies of what we're learning about dinosaurs, because you can tell they're still thinking of them as just movie monsters, Mm -hmm. right? If you, if you have it stuck in your head that gravity is a force that pulls downward, you're going to have a real hard time learning about the solar system. This is not how how it works, but it really, it gets stuck in there. 
And it's not just an education thing. And to add to that, it, it can be that it serves as an obstacle that makes it harder to learn something new. It can also be, as we mentioned before, sometimes people get really angry about the stuff yeah. that they learned in movies mm -hmm. versus when you have to either disappoint them because they've really built mm -hmm. that up in their head. Now, is this the movie maker's fault? No, it's that's where this argument is kind of weird, where it's yeah. it's sort of everyone's responsibility to make sure <laughs> that you're not getting your knowledge from movies, but at the same time, that's also part of the point of movies. That's why movies have morals, because you're supposed to learn from some movies, and Absolutely. it can be really hard to tell when is this a learning thing or is this a not learning thing. And the other thing that I wanted to mention, and I'm glad that you mentioned this a number of times so far, can this inaccuracy in movies affect real science? Mm -hmm. And the go-to example that I always think of is that I have spoken with multiple marine biologists who have told me that, that one of the biggest struggles in marine conservation is mm -hmm. trying to get people to forget about Jaws. Yep. It's not just that people have a wrong idea about sharks, it's that people's priorities when it comes to are you going to support an initiative to conserve sharks to maintain proper ocean ecosystems mm -hmm. and our source of fishing food and a source of biodiversity if the image in your head is Jaws. Yeah. And that makes for a big challenge for people. Absolutely. So it's it's one of those arguments where it it's not if it was the worst thing in the world we wouldn't have to argue about it. Yeah. It's obviously it's not like the end of the world, but you know, I think that there is an impact when the science of something when it when a depiction of something in a movie is repeatedly displayed inaccurately. And I think I think a big part of it is that in so many of these movies and so many of these issues where there are misconceptions is that kernel of truth, as it's often called. Oh, yeah. That there is either a kernel of truth or a followable logic. If it makes mm -hmm. sense that when someone is lying, on, like if you just saw someone, you know, I'm going to use my defibrillator concept again, but this could go for anything. If you just saw someone walking, grab their chest, fall over, stop moving, and then a person came up to them, listened to their chest, and then brought out a thing that shocked them and they woke back up. There's no reason I wouldn't be able to assume that person looked dead. That machine brought <laughs> yeah. them back. You know, yeah. So you're not completely wrong. It's not like you're like, and this defibrillator fixes your vision. You know, you're not making up ridiculous <laughs> stuff with it. There's a mm -hmm. kernel of truth. It does resuscitate people who are in the midst of a heart attack. It reestablishes their normal beat. It's the same with the dinosaurs of you are not completely off about there being things about dinosaurs we don't know, but then extrapolating that into spitting venom or the fact that sharks have attacked people, but bringing mm -hmm. that into it being a calculating monster. There's a reason that we already are more willing to agree with or believe that completely wrong idea, but it's close enough to the truth yeah. or things that we know so it's hard for us just to go no no jaws is completely fake because then i've had people counter all the time at the aquarium and go yeah but sharks do kill people like <laughs> yeah are you saying the news is lying because yeah they do <laughs> you know and it's like okay yes it has happened you know but now you have to go into this whole broader subject of well how often has <laughs> yeah, it happened? it's a discussion you know and now it's a dis the fact that it has to then become a discussion is purely because of these preconceptions that film has created, you know, yeah. sharks were rightly, you know, people were careful around sharks, just like you were around any predator before jaws. But then after jaws, there were coastal business, you know, beaches had some of their worst business years after jaws came out yep. because of people avoiding the water. <laughs> like it's a yeah, big deal. So it's, it's one of those, conversations where there's it's not an easy solution it's something that's interesting to talk about mm -hmm. i think s sort of the the takeaway is that it's not anyone's like it 
a film isn't bad if it has bad science. A filmmaker isn't mm-hmm. necessarily bad or irresponsible for for you know showing dinosaurs without feathers. Yeah. Although there is also the note to be made, and I think that this is a valid note that you have an entire generation of paleontologists looking at the screen and going, hmm, you know, we've we've been working really hard for two decades to learn about these animals that the entire popularity of your franchise is based off of. Yeah. I think there I think there's a little bit of a respect thing that comes up sometimes with scientists as well. But well, I promise we wouldn't ramble on this for a long time. <laughs> I I think one of the big the big points that I would make when it comes to accuracy in movies is no it is not the responsibility of a filmmaker to make sure that their movie is completely accurate to the real world, especially if they're making a movie that is not possible in the real world. Mm-hmm. You have to ignore some aspects of physics and science if you're going to make a superhero movie, because the Hulk don't work on paper. Like, yes. <laughs> he doesn't. <laughs> but the question I would pose to people who take that, that staunch stance of, it's just a movie, give it a break, is where do you draw the line? If I make a movie mm-hmm. and my protagonist's car breaks, or, you know, runs out of gas on the side of the road, and he goes, well, check in the back. I think I have some olive oil, and that's fairly flammable. Put that in the gas can, and we'll get going. And then it works, <laughs> and they go. Everyone in the audience would go, that's stupid, because it is. <laughs> it breaks. It's that suspension of disbelief. Exactly. Where do you draw that line? Our suspension of disbelief on paleontology is much stricter than most people's. Yes. <laughs> but <laughs> This is true. It's the same reason that you would not accept my olive oil car is the same reason we do not accept your bald dinosaurs. Yes. And it's where do you draw the line is what my question would be to everyone else. Yeah. And there are movies that have gotten in legitimate trouble for doing things inaccurately or failed because mm-hmm. people couldn't take them seriously or a number of things. Mm-hmm. Uh, James Cameron had to uh, go to someone's house and apologize for the way he depicted one of their family members in a movie. This was Titanic. Yeah, absolutely. It's, you know, we, we accept some inaccuracies, we don't accept others. But, all that being said, all of our discussion of science in movies, I will defend to the death the act of criticizing movie science. Because mm-hmm. criticizing movie science, not necessarily criticizing movies... Jurassic yes. Park is not a bad movie because its velociraptors are not velociraptors. But picking on the science and pointing out where the science is wrong and discussing the inaccuracies about the science is one of the most effective educational tools that scientists and science educators have. 100%. Jurassic Park reached more people in a weekend than most paleontologists could hope to reach in their lifetime. Yes. I will always, always defend piggybacking on that popularity to get some education about science out there in the world. Well, and it's, you know, as any good educator knows, any any classroom teacher, that a misconception is never a negative. It's just an opportunity to teach. You know, yes. if someone comes in and goes, yeah, but blank wives' tale, you know, old... Mm-hmm you know, whatever it is, then you just go, no, actually, and there's a lesson there. And you can do that yes. with every single sci-fi movie that has ever existed. And we have done it, in fact, with some of them. Yes. <laughs> and so th- I completely agree. Though I get why for some people it it would be annoying to have someone doing this right after you've seen the movie or while watching it at <laughs> yeah. home. We should be respectful about it. <laughs> yep. And... We would be lying if we were not if we said we were not those people <laughs> at times yeah, in our lives. It's, it's happened. It has <laughs> happened. But the act itself <laughs> is something that discussing an inaccuracy can never be bad. I believe that can always, if you're having a respectful discussion about the inaccuracy, then you can only learn from that. And I agree, dear listeners. This is a wonderful, fascinating kind of conversation to have. Mm-hmm. We have touched on the surface of it we've given our sort of off the top of our head answers we're gonna stop now because again we will go forever oh we are we are very close to dangerous rambling territory yes we are (laughs) but what do you think dear listeners in fact what do you think about this whole episode subject 
well, how do you mm-hmm. feel about Jurassic Park? What do you think about science in movies? And is it important to be accurate? Is it not important to be accurate? This is the kind of subject that people get angry about this subject, which is needless. You don't need to get angry about yes. this subject. But yeah, let us know if if you have an opinion on this, what you mm-hmm. think about it. We would love to hear from you. Please, please, please. This would be such a fun conversation to have with you all. Yes, it would. And if you want to have that conversation with us, you can find us on Facebook and Twitter and iTunes and all sorts of places. You can email us. Actually, if you're gonna if we're gonna have a public conversation, do it on Facebook or Twitter or somewhere where we can, yes. you know, sh- be out in the open and share it with people. Be respectful, please, if we're going to do that. Yes, please. And as you're doing that, please keep in mind that we love to hear from you for reviews and ratings for things like iTunes for subject discussions. Thank you again to the people who asked retroactively for this episode. <laughs> <laughs> uh, if if you want to hear different things, let us know if this was not exactly what you had in mind. Join us on Patreon if you want to support us in a financial sense. Keep listening and tell your friends if you want to support us in the general sense. Yeah. This has been a delightful episode. I oh, This episode boy. ended too quickly. Yeah. You, like I said, people, you just you, you say, well, that wasn't enough, and we will be doing it again. <laughs> <laughs> we'll be back. <laughs> Most of our episodes, there's the, there's the outline, and it's, all right, I said this, I said this, I said this. All right, yeah, we're on schedule, we're doing it right. This was just, like, I completely lost the timing of this episode, and we were mm-hmm. just talking, and I, uh, if you want to hear more, let us know. In Please the meantime, <laughs> we release podcast episodes every fortnight, so two weeks from now, keep your eye out for episode 24, whatever that is, mm-hmm. and we will see you then. I'm trying to think of a sign-off phrase. We haven't quoted the movie enough in this episode. When you gotta go, you gotta go. Life will find a way, folks. (laughs) Mr. Hammond, (laughs) the phones are working. (laughs) I have decided not to endorse this podcast. (laughs) (laughs) That's it, that's it. No, 100%. That's it. And end of the episode. Thanks for listening to the Common Descent Podcast. For more from us, you can follow us on the Common Descent Podcast Twitter account, Facebook page, or on our WordPress blog, where we post additional cool stuff for each episode. The song you're hearing is called On the Origin of Species by Protodome. You can find this and other video game remix music at ocremix.org. Thanks again for listening. We hope to see you next time. Thank you.